What's good, everyone? Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I am your host, Anthony Benitez, and I want to welcome every single listener from Belgium to New York City, from Mexico. And hey, listen, we also got some listeners, loyal listeners from Japan. That's freaking amazing. What's up, guys? Today's going to be an awesome episode. Today, I am going to tackle a question that is super valid, and it's going to help you. We have to realize that the root of every single problem, addiction, bad habit, insecurity, every root, every bad root in our lives, you want to know where the root is? It's condemnation. There's something that happens when the cross of Christ and the simplicity of preaching forgiveness of sins, something supernatural happens. And it's just like God to use the simple things to confound the mighty and the wise and the super complex intellectual. Whenever we talk about, like for instance, if I were to say, hey, you need to listen more to the forgiveness of sins. Any Christian would be like, no, no, I get it. Like I'm forgiven. I get it. But I find it very interesting. If you go to the book of Acts. If you go to the book of Acts and you read throughout the book of Acts what Peter preached, what Paul the apostle preached when he, when they went to evangelize, when they when they went to visit churches, they preached the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. It was so simple. It was so simple that to the religious fleshly puffed up mind, we think it's barbaric. We think that it's nomadic. We think that it's primitive. We think that, man, how can me understanding that my sins have been sent away, my sins have been removed, how is that going to help me? Because we have to understand this. I love what Jeremiah by the Spirit said. He said that the heart is so corrupt. Anthony, I thought you were a grace preacher. I am. Listen, Jeremiah by the Spirit, he said the heart, of a man the human heart is so deep it's so corrupt that we ourselves we have no ability no intelligence to even heal ourselves that's that's in reality that's anti-christ so why am i saying all these things because we have to understand that the root of every single problem, bad habit, insecurity, any form of death in our lives, emotionally, physically, relationally, financially, every bit of death, what's happening is that we need to receive more life. And when we listen to the word of Christ, when we hear about the forgiveness of sins, something supernatural happens. Why? You know, the Lord has been showing me this and I really want to impart this to you. We don't realize how how much we condemn, how much we damn ourselves. You realize that to be sin conscious, to be self-condemned, every root, every form of death, every destruction comes from us. It's not God punishing us, but rather it's a wrong belief. It's us. It's self-sabotage. It's self-harm, really. You know, like I said before, we shame people who have cut themselves physically, but we do this spiritually within. Just no one can see it. We self-sabotage relationships. We self-sabotage opportunities that God has brought into our lives. I can't receive this. Oh no, I, how can I receive this gift? How can I receive this blessing? How can I receive this, this and this and that? We begin to damn ourselves. We begin to condemn ourselves. And our heart is so deep. It's like a deep well. That's why I brought up that scripture in Jeremiah. Because we can't even understand how deep this heart goes. We don't understand the complexities of the subconscious. And when we try to go into, you know, understanding subconscious and visualization, that's new age. It's not your responsibility. It's not my responsibility to understand how the subconscious mind works. It's not my responsibility to understand how, you know, specific thinking patterns have been ingrooted because of this, you know, subconscious and subliminal messages and all that. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to look at Jesus. My responsibility is to learn more about his righteousness as a gift. My responsibility is to learn what has happened for me on the cross of Christ because the heart is so 
so deep, so rooted in in uh, self-effort, so rooted in the merit system that the minute that we make a mistake and I'm not going to prophesy, but this is just inevitable. You will make a mistake. You will fail, whether it's in thought, deed, word, action, you will fail. So what happens when you fail? What happens when you make a mistake? What happens when that door of opportunity comes knocking in? Will you humble yourself to receive that blessing? Will you humble yourself to be able to receive the gift of God? And we think that it, this is so simple, but it's not. We, like we, we don't realize how uh, corrupt, the Bible says, the depravity of, of all humanity is found in the flesh. We don't realize how much pride there is in man. Even as a Christian, until we renew our minds, we're a new creation. We understand that. But our minds, if left unrenewed, they're still tapping into the old way, the old thinking way, the old pattern, the old system of how the old nature thinks. Scarcity, merit, effort, discipline, self-sabotage, self-damage, self-damnation. So why am I saying all these things? I'm building this foundation because you have to realize that a lot of the times, I'll give you an example in my own personal life. The Bible says you rejoice in your weaknesses. So this is what I do. When I jump on the mic, you're not going to hear me talk about how handsome I am, how tall, dark, and handsome, how great I am. No, what, I, what, I, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to rejoice in my weaknesses. I jump on here and I tell you how weak I am, how the Lord has helped me and is going to continue to help me. Why? Because Paul, by the Spirit, said, I rejoice in my infirmities. I rejoice in my weaknesses. And even when I'm talking with Ethan or, or Declan or whatever it is, when you minister to people, it, it doesn't really uh, impart spiritual impact when you talk about how great you are. You ever notice that? Like if you're talking to someone, even if you go get coffee with someone, you go, uh, you know, grab a, a kombucha with someone, whatever it is, and you talk to them, it, it really doesn't help the other person on the other side of the conversation if you just begin to boast about yourself, how awesome you are, how cool you are. Though you may be cool, though you may be awesome, there's no spiritual impact in that. But when you begin to talk to another person, honestly, sincerely, and you begin to say, hey, you know, I, this is my weakness and or the Lord delivered me out of this two years ago. Another person on the other line is like, really? Wow, I would never think that. Yeah, you know, I used to be so shy. Yeah, I used to stutter. Yeah, I used to, I used to struggle sleeping. All these things. It's like when w there's something supernatural that happens when you and I as Christians begin to rejoice in our weaknesses. Because the Bible says His grace is perfected when we are weak. His grace is made perfect in our weaknesses his strength is perfected in our weaknesses you ever go to like science or biology it's a negative and a positive and you put a negative and a positive together and the result is an explosion what happens is that we as human beings we try to be positive when in reality the state is we're negative god is positive so if we try to put our best foot forward with god it's positive and positive and doesn't do anything it actually repels isn't that interesting? A positive and positive, it, it's, like a, it's like a magnet. You ever try to put two magnets together? They end up just repelling each other. God's grace is not attracted to your strength, friend. God's grace is attracted to your weaknesses. So the more we understand that, the more we're able to believe right. So when you talk to people at work, when you talk to your, your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, your friends, it's not about you. They don't want to hear how cool you are, how awesome you are. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear about, you know what? I struggled through this three years ago, and this is what the Lord has shown me. You begin When you begin to do that, there's something that happens that it, it's like, you know, humanity, we long for, for community. We long for religious people call it fellowship. I'm, I'm not going to use that because I, I, I don't like that word. But, but humanity longs for community. Humanity longs for relationships and genuine ones. So when we begin to just be real with each other and realize that God's grace is perfected when we are weak, there's something that happens. In the book of James, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another so that you may be healed. It's not that we need to be forgiven, but there's something 
about there's something there's some sort of healing that I can't even understand when you begin to bring your darkness into the light. In fact, that's what it says in the scriptures that when that which is darkness is brought up into the light, it becomes light. I remember maybe like four years ago, I uh, the Lord freshly saved me, and there was a good friend of mine at this church that I used to go to in L.A., and he came over, and this dude was like, um, he's now a pastor at that church. Awesome dude. And he was like on, he was like an elder of the church, and I was maybe like six months saved. We were living at that one spot, uh, Drea, that one dope high rise. So he came over and now he's a pastor, but he came over. He, he was an elder back then. And he's like, hey, can I just can we just grab some coffee? So I said, yeah, sure. He comes over and um, he begins to tell me about certain things that he was struggling with. And he was like maybe 20 years in as a Christian. And me being saved maybe like seven months, I didn't know what to say, but that scripture came up that when something, something that is dark, when we hide our weaknesses, they stay alive in the darkness. But when we confess our faults, our weaknesses, you know, when Dre and I were dating, that's something that, that's one of the biggest things that attracted me to her and her to me I would say is that we were just honest we talked about you know hey you know our childhood and we, we were just honest with each other and all the darkness all the skeleton bones in the closet just became light because the Bible says whatever is of darkness when you bring it to the light that darkness now becomes light so there's something there's like a healing flow that happens when we become honest with each other. And and I noticed that. And when that dear brother of mine over four years ago was was telling me about, you know, his struggle, uh, I didn't, I mean, who who am I to like, like I'm like, oh man, I don't even know what denomination means. But all I knew was the Lord brought that scripture up to me and I ministered to him. You know, we prayed and, and, and the Lord healed his soul from all that damnation and self-damnation and self-condemnation and all that, that yuckiness that we feel when we make a mistake. Why am I saying these things? Because the cross of Christ, I'm going to be talking about this. Is there any more God's, is there any more wrath left? Where, what about God's holiness? What about God's wrath? What about punishment? What about karma? What about seed time and harvest? Because in the, in the past church that we were at, even, um, Drea and Kim went to a church they were um, doing some sort of business and that dude from that church who was a leader told Drea my wife when when they were when uh, Kim and Ethan were like hey you know how did all this come about and then this dude said well you know if you know about the principle of seed time and harvest this is just seed time and harvest and it's it's true to an extent to finances but when I was at that previous church back in PA uh that was their biggest principle. That was like their God was seed time and harvest. And I remember because I was sitting with the leadership of that church and I'm treading lightly now, but I was sitting with the leadership of that church at lunch and there was uh, another Christian brother up in, you know, in ranks, a high influential Christian leader and he fell into sin or whatever. And then the other leader at the church that I was at was like, well, you know, it is seed time and harvest. You know, if, if you, you you get what you sow, you know what that's called? That's called karma. You know what that's called? That's called the law of sin and death. That's it, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. It, it works like that when it comes to finances. But what they were saying and with that church that uh, Kim and, and Drev, when they went to visit that church, what they're saying is the law. is that you get what you, you sow, you reap what you sow. If you sow sin, you will reap death. If you sow, you know, uh, like if, if you cuss someone out, if you fail, well, then you're going to reap death. It, you get what you sow. That's what, tell me the difference between that and karma. Tell me the difference between that and the law of sin and death. That when you make a mistake, you're bound to be punished. That's what that is, really. So, and then on the other end, well, if you do good, then you will receive good. That's the law. 
That's karma. What's the difference between that and, and the law? That's not grace. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. You don't get what you deserve, but you get what you don't deserve because of the cross of Christ. And, and the reason why I'm so hard against this, first of all, in Titus, the Bible says, rebuke with all authority. Teach, exhort, correct, and rebuke with all authority. Why? Because these types of doctrines will enslave you. Why? Because you are human. You will make a mistake. And trust me, if me as a pastor understanding grace, whenever I make a mistake on a daily basis, there's this thought that comes to my head. Well, like today, I was just laying down you know, in my sofa and there was a thought, you know, because you're making this mistake, you're never going to receive more revelation. And if I receive that, how much more the sheep? If, I, if those thoughts run through my head, which is the flesh or it's the devil, it's important for us to preach against these things because it brings light where there is darkness in the way of thinking. So there is seed time and harvest, but exclusively that's talking about finances. So you don't get what you deserve on this side of heaven. You get what Jesus deserves. Write that down somewhere. Jesus is your holiness. Jesus is your righteousness. This is so prevalent, Dre, because even as I was talking to my father-in-law a couple of weeks ago, he, you know, he, he was having a bad dream, a nightmare. He was getting attacked in his dream, and he was, he's like, hey, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, what's up? And he was like, well, you know what? This has happened. And he's like, well, I haven't made a mistake. You know, I haven't been haven't been doing anything wrong. And he has a love for God. But you, but you notice how ingrained this is to our our mind. And I began to tell him, listen, even if you did screw up, you don't get what you deserve. And I pointed at this flower pot and I was like, that flower pot is Jesus. I said, not literally, but I'm using an illustration. That flower pot is Jesus. OK. And he said, OK. I said, you get what he deserves. You're right with God because of him, not because of you. You get his righteousness, his holiness. Another one. When uh, when we first moved back to L.A., we went to this pastor's meeting up in uh, Bel Air. And this dude, uh, he's a pastor. And again, go to Titus. The Bible says you rebuke doctrine with all authority. I was talking with Declan the other day and he was telling me how, um, you know, one of his friends was uh, listening to this wrong teacher or whatever. One of his friends or coworkers, whatever. And then uh, and then he's like, you know, what do I do? I said, don't condemn. Just let it be. And then I, I texted him. I said, well, I said, now you're happy that I correct when I'm on the audio podcast, right? And he said, he's like, yeah. I was like, see, because before, because I've gotten this. Well, why are you so harsh? I, I'm, I'm never going to defame a person's character, but I will always correct and rebuke because that's what the Bible says to do as a leader within the church. To correct and rebuke doctrine that enslaves people, doctrines of devil, because the way the way that the devils enslave you is is through doctrines. That's why it's called doctrines of devils. So if a chain is a doctrine, guess when I break a chain, guess what I'm breaking? I'm breaking a doctrine. So I texted Declan. I said, well, I bet you now that you're happy that I correct and I'm hard sometimes when, I, when I'm on the podcast. Because the thing is, you know, it's always about trying to keep the unity within the church until someone that you love or that you care for is into the wrong doctrine. Then you wish for a leader to stand up and preach the truth. It's all like, you know, let's just like let, let them be. But until your mom starts listening to the wrong doctrine and then maybe she's listening to me here and there, then you would pray to God for and ask for the spirit of might, for the apostolic anointing to preach on the audio platform to bring down those doctrines of devils that enslave. So why am I saying this? So when we move back to L.A., we went to this pastor's meeting and this pastor, he's been a pastor for 50 years. He was a pastor at a, at a large mega church here in California. And for Easter, he had 90,000 people last year. Remember, Dre? And he jumped on there and he was talking about Leviticus, about 
in, there's a, a scripture in Leviticus that talks about the high priest having a golden bar on his head saying holiness unto the Lord. You know what that speaks of? That is talking about Christ, how his thoughts are perfect before God. And when God sees you, he sees Jesus' thoughts. He doesn't see your thoughts. He sees Jesus' thoughts. So that high priest, the the all the garments that's described in the book of Leviticus, the golden bar on his head that says holiness unto the Lord. It's not telling you to always think holy because that's works and that would enslave you. It's telling us that Jesus thinks perfectly and his thoughts satisfy God. So when God sees you, he sees Christ. When God sees your thoughts, he does not see your thoughts. He sees Jesus' thoughts, which are perfect. See, that's grace. So this guy, seasoned in the church, had 90,000 people at Easter the year before. And he jumps on there, remember, Dre, at a pastor's meeting. And he's preaching about, you know, the high priest having a gold bar on his head. And he's saying, well, this is why we as leaders need to think holy at all times. We need, and they talk about holiness and you need to be holy. And if not, and you know, you got to stay away from this. And it's like you're just enslaving an entire, first of all, like you're 50 years into the ministry. And yet, this is what baffles me. And this is what frustrates me. And I'm not here ranting, but this, this is, this is the, the, the level of ignorance to the ways of grace and the ways of God that you and I, Knowing the truth, we, we, it is important for us to continuously renew our minds. Like, if you're listening to me, why would you be listening to someone else that preaches works? Why are you listening to that person who you know in the word of faith is preaching works all the time? Why? Why are you damaging yourself? Why? Because, again, it goes back to understanding that we are forgiven completely. Because if we don't understand that we've been forgiven completely, we will do, we will do these subtle things to harm ourselves. We will sabotage relationships. We will begin to inflict us with anxiety and fear. I've been there because we don't think we deserve it. Because we haven't seen the cross of Christ yet. So I want to tell you today that it's not you don't get what you deserve, friend. You get what Jesus deserves. God doesn't see your actions. He sees Jesus' perfect actions. You are not your own righteousness. Jesus is your righteousness. You are not your own holiness. Jesus is your holiness. When God sees you, he sees Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about your actions. And when we realize this, we take our eyes off of ourselves and we look to Christ and then healing comes. Peace is there. You can't break habits by being taught five ways to break this habit. If you can break that habit, then why did Christ come? If you can break that addiction, then why do you have the Holy Spirit? Are you God? Are you the Holy Spirit? Why would God give us the Holy Spirit? Then why did God send his son? The Bible says this. He said, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you have the ability to be holy, if you have the ability to, ability to deliver yourself, if you have the ability to break that own habit, then Christ died in vain. Then, then Christ died for nothing. Then you have the Holy Spirit for nothing. But... Christ died because we can't deliver ourselves. Christ died because we can't be perfect. Christ died because we can't keep the law. So he kept the law for us. So when I was in Bible school and, and I dropped out, um, and you might be listening, and I love this man. And this was a valid question. When I began to, as I, as I was trying to, you know, run away and, and quit this Bible school because the Lord opened my eyes to grace and I began to see how much bondage that uh, this denomination was in and his preaching. You know, I began to preach a little bit of grace because I was still, I was a student, but I was a pastor. It's complicated. But this other student of mine and friend, I guess, student slash, I don't know, this guy, 
he was like, uh, well, what about God's wrath? What about God's holiness? Because if you do wrong, you know, you're still going to be punished. I said, and he's like, what about God's wrath? And I said, okay, but what about Christ? What about Jesus Christ and his finished work? So today I want to tell you, when you make a mistake, you're, the Bible says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no more punishment to them that are in Christ Jesus. Next verse. Because that, that second part of that verse was never there in, in the original manuscript. That's why in the NASB, they translated it perfect. And, and you, if you go to any other uh, reputable Bible translation, it will tell you that that second part in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 was never there in the original context. So it ends there. It ends with this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, period. Verse 2, why? Why is there no more punishment for you? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death is that when you sin, you receive death because of it. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has now set you free from the law of of sin and death. When you sin, you receive death. You receive punishment. That law has been set aside. You are now under the law of the spirit of life. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, where sin increases, grace superporisio, it superabounds. So instead of you receiving what you deserve, now where you are weak, grace the Bible says, my grace is perfected in your weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So now instead of when you make a mistake, there's no more punishment. But instead, if you can believe the truth, which is the truth, that when you make a mistake, you are primed to receive huperparisio grace, hyper overflowing grace in that area. Well, why? Because I can teach you this. But ultimately, the conscious is not tranquilized until we realize why. I can tell you that when you make a mistake, when you fail, instead of receiving punishment, the truth is because you, make, because you made that mistake, now you receive hyper overflowing grace in that area of weakness. But the question here is why? Because the conscious is needs to be educated your conscious must be educated to the truth your conscious knows what you did last summer and i can tell you well instead of receiving punishment you know uh, johnny boy now you're going to receive hooper Patricio grace and johnny boy can be like you know i receive it but he goes back home puts his head on the pillow and his conscience is asking him well, why? why 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 do you first of all why do you not receive punishment second of all why instead of punishment do you now receive hooper Patricio grace hyper overflowing grace well we have to look to the cross of christ yes god is holy yes god has wrath yes sin cannot go unpunished because God would not be a just God. He would not be righteous. I'll give you this example. Let's say you have a judge in a small town. And the judge is known to be a righteous judge. If he is a good judge, he will not bend the law for anybody. So one day, as he's given out indictments, his son is brought in front of the court. And his son is brought, and, he, and then his, the judge is like, what are you doing here? And then hit the, persecu the pr persecutor, the prosecutor against his son says, your son was found breaking and entering. And not only that, he accidentally shot the person that he was committing robbery to. And we found him red-handed. The judge who is his dad has a gavel in his hand. If the judge says, well, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, Freddie, I, I know you're a little bit mischievous and, you know, you have to understand, you know, prosecutor, my, my son, he's a little bit mischievous and, you know, he didn't mean to shoot this dude in the face. He didn't mean to break and enter. Uh, you know, you have to just you, you let boys be boys. He's 15 years old. He was probably smoking pot. He was, you know, probably high. He, he, there's, there's no blame here. You know, let bygones be bygones. We have to let it go. Case closed. And then he hits the gavel and says, well, case dismissed. 
is he a just is he a just judge is he a righteous judge if he if he would do that no you see if the judge is righteous and just he cannot bend the law for anybody including his son so his son bring, being brought to the court with evidence that he committed this heinous crime the judge cannot bend even though it's his blood son even though his son is sitting in there ready to be detained for 15 years to life the judge cannot even address him as son or freddy boy or his you know childhood nickname the judge must be addressed as judge and the person in question must be addressed as a person in question not as his son so this is what happened all of us have fallen short and sinned the bible says in romans we all have fallen short and sinned so we were that person that was brought to trial we broke the law whether it's in deed in mind whatever it is the law is perfect i've talked about this so humanity has broken the law Humanity has a death sentence on their head. Sin must be punished. The judge, if he's worth any of his weight, he cannot bend the law for anybody. So we were brought to court. And the judge, the God, the creator of everything, he was there. And he, and he cannot just bypass sin. He cannot just let boys be boys. But imagine yourself in that courtroom. But now someone else comes in. And his name is Jesus. And he says, yes, you're right. Freddy Boy did break and enter and shoot this dude in his face. Yes, he is guilty. But I, and this is like even naturally to explain this, it's a little like it's natural. It's, there's, it's supernatural. So I'm going to do my best here to explain it in English. But Jesus came in and he said, yes, he's guilty. But I will become him. And I will receive every punishment that he deserves. I will take on his identity. I will become sin. I will become Freddy boy. I will become one with him. So the death sentence, the death penalty, I will receive for him. So here we have the law being magnified and fulfilled. Yes, humanity has sinned. Yes, humanity has broken God's law. But there is a substitute, someone who became you and paid not just for your sin that you committed before you got saved, but every single sin for your entire life. God is outside of time. He is eternal. If, he were, if God were to be constrained by time, then time would be greater than God. But God created time for man. In fact, God is outside of time. So when he saw you and when Jesus came into that courtroom, before they put the needle in your, in your vein, the death sentence needle in your vein, he said, I will become him. I will become sin. I will take on his identity and I will pay for every single sin this man, this woman has committed, will ever commit in, in their entire life. So here we have the law of God being magnified and fulfilled. God didn't just say, let boys be boys, but he, he prosecuted the law to its fullest extent. Jesus became sin. The cross of Christ magnifies the holiness of God and the love of God. He took on our sin. Every single sin from now to before to after in the future. Every single sin for your life. The punishment was laid on the body of Christ. And for the life of me in this tenured Bible school where the, the, that church is bringing in millions a year. Yet we have a seasoned Bible student, and it's not even his fault. Is we're not even taught this. Jesus is out of the church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter thirteen, verse one, that Jesus left the house and he went to sit down by the seaside. He left the house to sit by the world because the house has denied Christ. So he says, fine, if you deny me, I will leave the church and I will go and find people of the world. The sea represents the world because it's always restless. So Jesus is 
He has upheld the law. He has fulfilled the law. God has punished sin. Sin is no more. That is why the Bible says right after Isaiah 53, which talks about the crucifixion of Christ, Isaiah 54, it talks about how there is no more wrath. I will never be angry with you, God says. Why? Because of what just happened in Isaiah 53. Why will God never be angry with you and I? Because we're perfect? No, because you see, everything, the, the law has been fulfilled. It's been satisfied. It's been magnified. It's been upheld. Yes, we make mistakes, but every single mistake that you can't even know, every mistake of ignorance, every sin of omission, commission, every sin of thought, deed, word, action, intention, every single sin was laid on the body of Christ. And God punished his son to the point where in the middle of the day, in the Gospels, it says that the middle of the day, it became pitch black. There was an earthquake. It became pitch black. Because God cannot even look at sin. He turned his back from his son. Why? Because his son became sin for you and for me. So there was no more wrath left for you. Jesus drank the cup. The cup represents the wrath of God. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath for you and for me. And we, he took our place and we take his place. Every, every single fulfillment of the law that he did is laid to our account. So when God sees you, he sees you in Christ. That is why there's no more punishment for you. But even more than that, you are now under, un, you are now under God's unclouded favor. When you make a mistake, when you sin, when you fail, you don't have to expect punishment. Why? Because the punishment has been paid. There's no double jeopardy here. If Jesus paid for your sin, what are you doing paying for your sin? By, by punishing yourself, by sabotaging your relationships, your good opportunities. Why? Because we have to realize that our conscious, unless it knows this, and your conscious even now, I believe the Lord's even just like a healing balm, just soothing your conscience. Every sin has been paid for. Not only that, but I want to end with this. In the Old Testament, a type in shadow was if someone sinned, they would bring a sin offering, which is a goat. And you know what a scapegoat is? Someone who takes the blame. So this physical goat, if let's say if I sinned, I, I would bring a goat and I would lay my hands on the head of the goat. Why? Because that is me imparting my sin into the scapegoat. This is all a type of Jesus. And then the scapegoat will be punished. But not only that, the scapegoat and, an, and another offering found in Leviticus, the scapegoat would then be sent into the wilderness. The, so the scapegoat will receive all the sin and the scapegoat will then be, would then be, be released into the wilderness. Because the Bible says, I will, never re I will never remember your sins anymore. As far as, it, as far as east is from west, meaning east and west don't ever touch. As far as east is from west, so have I removed all of your sins. In the same exact way that that scapegoat is sent into the wilderness, once the sin is imparted onto it, your sin has been sent away. It's been removed. It's been, no, it's been removed away from your life. And sickness is a part of sin. Mental torment is a part of sin. Everything that we be, that belonged to us because of sin, Jesus took it. So that is why there's no more wrath for you. That is why there's no more punishment for you. Because of Jesus. So you can stop punishing yourself now. You can stop sabotaging your life now. You can start you can stop trying to impose anxiety upon you. You can stop beating yourself up now. You can stop being insecure now. You can stop being so fearful now because there is no more con a condemnation for them, for them that are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is, present tense, now no more punishment for them that are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free 
from the law of sin and death. There is no more punishment. The cup full of God's wrath, Jesus drank it fully. All the way down to the drags, he drank all of God's wrath. So for you and I, in Christ, when God looks at us, he doesn't see sin on us. Sin has been removed. It's been put aside because of the cross of Christ. There is no more wrath between you and God. And that's why this Bible is called the, the, the gospel, or this gospel is called the gospel of peace. Peace with what? Is there peace in humanity? No, I mean, there's wars left and right. Peace with you and God. There is no more beef between you and your father. All of your sins have been punished and paid for and sent away. So now, if you make a mistake, if you fail, it's important for you to look at the cross of Christ within. It's important for you to reckon yourself that Jesus took this mistake. And even furthermore, which is a whole other teaching, because of this mistake, I now receive hupropodisio grace. I receive 120% restoration. Why? Because Jesus is my guilt offering. I've become righteous. He has become sin. And the sin pays to the righteous 120% according to the guilt offering found in Leviticus. So when you make a mistake, when you fail, when you fall on your butt, instead of believing and exercising your faith for punishment, you now realize the truth that Jesus not only paid and took away this sin for you over 2,000 years ago, he already saw it. It's removed. There's, there's no beef between you and God. But Jesus also became your guilt offering. And according to the guilt offering law found in Leviticus, this is where Paul this is where Paul gleaned it from. Why else would he say where sin increased, grace superabounds? Where did he find this at? He found it in the book of Leviticus, the guilt offering. Because the five offerings found in Leviticus, five being the number of grace, signify the one offering of Christ. And one of the five offerings found in Leviticus is the guilt offering. And the guilt offering, the law says that this the person who has been found guilty pays the righteous party 120%. Are you righteous? Yes. Where? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He became sin so that you can become the righteousness of God in Christ. So because you are righteous and because Jesus became sin, the sin party pays the righteous party 120% according to the guilt offering found in Leviticus. So now when you sin, you see that sin on the body of Christ and you see yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ. So now when you fail, instead of receiving punishment, you now receive 120% restoration according to the Levitical law, which is a type of Jesus, the Levitical guilt offering he that is a type of the lord jesus where is that in the bible anthony i want to end with this paul by the spirit he was able to interpret exactly what i'm talking about when he was talking about ministers being paid well he said does not the law of moses this isn't found in corinthians does not the law of moses command that if an oxen is treading out the grain you shall not muzzle an ox. That is a law under Leviticus. And Paul was able to interpret that type. And that type is a type of a minister treading out bread, the word of God, for you. So he was able to interpret the Levitical law found in the in the book of the law of Moses that you shall not muzzle an ox while it's treading out grain. He was able to interpret that as a minister of the word of God. In the same exact manner, the guilt offering found in Leviticus is a type of Jesus becoming our guilt offering. The sin party pays the righteous party 120% restoration. So Jesus became the sin party. Though he did no sin, he became sin. And we, 
Though we do no righteous deeds, we become righteous. So the sin party pays the righteous party 120% whenever there is a flaw or fail. So when you make a mistake, you can now receive 120% restoration if you realize you're the righteousness of God in Christ. So every weakness is a conduit for God's blessing to flow through. You can become so radical with this that you can look at your, your, your weaknesses, your flaws, and by simply confessing with the tongue of your mouth, the tongue, you see, in the Old Testament, they would use a hyssop. The priest would use a hyssop to apply the blood. The hyssop is a type of your tongue. You are a priest. So when the spirit of faith speaks, so when you use the hyssop, which is your tongue, to confess that Jesus is your guilt offering, you are exercising your right as a royal priesthood and receiving 120% restoration. This is meat for the mature. So now, this is why everything is kosher when it comes to where sin increases, grace superabounds. So now, it, you have spiritual intelligence. As a priest, when you make a mistake... If you're able to see the guilt offering, if you're able to see what I'm talking about, Jesus is the sin party. Jesus became your sin. He, he bore your punishment. And now you are the righteous party. So now when you make a mistake, when you fail, not only do you not receive punishment because Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath, but because you are the righteousness of God in Christ, now you are able to position yourself by simply confessing and receiving 120% restoration in the area of your weakness. How can you lose? How, how, so that, that is why Paul, by the Spirit, said, I rejoice in my weaknesses. So I want to leave you guys with that, that the wrath of God has been satisfied. The law has been magnified. The law has been upheld. And it has been fulfilled. And it, now that it's fulfilled, it's been set aside. And now you're under grace. You're, you don't get what you deserve. You are not to keep the law. You're under grace. So I want to leave you guys with that. This is probably one of the tentacle, the tentacles of our faith is realizing Jesus as the sin offering. As the guilt offering. Those five offerings found in the book of Leviticus. Those five offerings are to explain the one offering of Christ. So when you realize that, there's a peace offering, there's a guilt offering, there's a, there's a sin offering, and, and there, there's, there's many, many ones which I don't have the time today to explain it, but when you realize the cross of Christ, it brings tranquilization to your soul, and your, your faith is able to be freed to receive more grace. In every single area of weakness. So, what about the wrath of God? What about the holiness of God? Well, we just answered it. His holiness, it was not compromised. It was upheld. His wrath, it wasn't set aside, but it was satisfied on the body of Christ. And now, you're under, you're under God's unclouded favor. Now, when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Now, when God sees you, he sees you in the beloved. When Christ, who is our life, Colossians says. So, Jesus is you. You is Jesus and Jesus is you. You are not the Christ, but he is your identity. He is your life. So, when you realize that, then, what, then there is no need for self-obsession or self-introspection. But rather, you become obsessed with Jesus in a good way. And you become very zealous of people that try to take the glory away from His Son. You become zealous for the work of Christ. You become passionate for the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ. So, I want to leave you guys with that. Friend, you don't have to 
destroy your life. You don't have to harm yourself. You don't have to offer little sin offerings here and there. You don't have to be under guilt and shame. You deserve, you deserve to live a life of enjoyment, fulfillment, and freedom. Why? Because of your actions? No, because of Jesus. That's what he did for you. And you glorify him. And you worship God by honoring the work of Christ. You dishonor God by rejecting the finished work of Christ. You tempt God by saying Jesus did not do a finished work. But you honor and worship God. You, people talk about the fear of God. The fear of God is installed in you when you are zealous and when you rest in the finished work of His Son. But there is no fear of God when you reject the Son of God. There is no fear of God when you reject the finished work of Christ. But you honor God when you look to Jesus and say, well, I rest in His finished work. Case dismissed. So, I want to leave you guys with that. And I will see you in the next one.